Welcome back to The Look and Sound of Leadership, an ongoing series of executive coaching tips designed to help you be perceived in the workplace the way you want to be perceived. I'm Tom Henschel, your executive coach, and today we're talking about fighting authority. Christine called me to talk about Matthew. Christine was a longtime client of mine. We'd enjoyed working together. When we'd first met, the feedback about her was that she was very black and white, and she understood the feedback. She knew she placed a high value on order and no drama, and she knew sometimes those values could make her rigid. By the time the coaching ended, she had gained flexibility. She had felt expanded. And a couple of years later, she'd left her old position. She joined the leadership team at a smaller agency. We talked maybe once a year. She loved her new role and her fellow leaders, all of whom happened to be male. Matthew was one of her direct reports. She told me, he's good, Tom. Smart, fast, sharp instincts, but boy, is he impatient. He doesn't care about systems or procedures or the mechanics we've put in place. He doesn't see why everything can't get done right now. It's so naive for someone so smart. I asked, how far along is this guy? You mean how old? Early 30s? I asked, is this the millennial stereotype? You know, I've been here six months. Where's my promotion? No, I don't think it's that. It's hard to put my finger on. He's really a pleasure most of the time. But then sometimes there are like five things in a row he's complaining about, or people are complaining about him. But no, you know, overall, people like him. That's surprising, I said. A lot of times when I hear about behavior like that, people are fed up. No, people like Matthew. I like Matthew. You know what it is. When he gets upset, he gets angry. Golly, I had better self-control in junior high school. When Matthew's around, people raise their voices. I don't like it. And I don't think it's necessary. I don't like the drama, and Matthew is the common denominator. I asked, so he loses his temper sometimes? For sure, she said. And when he loses his temper, who is he losing his temper at? It happens in meetings, she said. Only in meetings, I asked? Not with people one-on-one? -on -one? Oh, no, certainly one-on-one, -on -one too. I meant not in private. You know, people are around. People hear it. He'll raise his voice no matter where he is or who he's with. Does he have direct reports, I asked? Not really. Contractors, but he's not really their supervisor. Does he lose his temper at them? No, if anything, he's their champion. So he's only getting angry at people in authority, I asked? In a much slower, quieter tone, she said, Is that possible? And then with surprise, she said, That feels right. It sounds like this is a new thought for you, I said. It is. I never thought of Matthew's drama as being aimed at us. Us, I asked. You're including yourself in this? She gave a verbal eye roll, saying, You have no idea. Can you tell me, I asked. Oh, Lordy, oh, you're not going to believe this. And let me preface it by saying this was not my shining hour either, but okay, here's the story. We had to let a contractor go because of two serious violations. And it happens sometimes. We know how to handle this. Well, that contractor, who happened to be a woman, by the way, had Matthew as an ally. And when he found out we were letting her go, he barged into my office and started yelling at me. He was angry before he hit the door. He had no intention of asking a question like maybe a, hey, why is this happening? He came in fighting. Of course, you know, I couldn't have told him what was going on with this woman anyway, so every answer I gave him sounded like total bullcrap to him. He got angrier and angrier, and there was no stopping him until I raised my voice too, which I did not like doing. As I said, not my finest hour. A little confused, I asked, what argument could he possibly make? He was all incensed that we were being hypocritical, and we couldn't be trusted, and we were just profit mongers. We, I asked, who's we? We, she said, fingers towards her chest. The leadership team, it was aimed at all of us. All of you? As a block? Can you believe it? Yelling at his boss about something he really doesn't know anything about? I could never have yelled at my boss like that. Could you? Oh, me? I answered. <laughs> Hardly. 
which is not to say I had the healthiest relationship with authority myself. I think I was just as goofy as Matthew when it comes to authority. I was just goofy in the opposite direction. You think Matthew's goofy, she laughed. I said, I don't know the guy, Christine, but you're telling me the story of someone who has trouble with one particular population, people in authority. Around authority, this normally nice guy loses his temper. Around authority, he's out of balance. He's not realistic. So, yeah, that's goofy. She said, that was an interesting thought. What was? That thing you said about one particular population. It made me think maybe this is a kind of bias on Matthew's part. Like, he may not even know he's doing it. But yes, this one population authority seems to make him angry. If he were reacting this way to women or people of color or Muslims or whatever, I'd have noticed that. I'd have called him out on that. But I didn't even notice this. Now it's my turn to say that was an interesting thought. What did I say, she asked. The word bias. Thinking that this weirdness we all have about authority is a form of bias is a really helpful way to think about it. Weirdness, she echoed. I said, I think authority can trip us up because we all were little ones. A lot of people had power over us, and we learned ways to react to those people when they were fair to us and when they weren't. And then we grow up, and we bring those same reactions with us into our education experience and our early careers. We react to authority the way we always have. And look, it took me a long, long time to stop seeing authority through my childhood filters. And like I say, I was just on the opposite side from Matthew. Opposite how, she asked. I said, Matthew fights. I was fearful. Really? You? Oh, yeah, for years. Do you want a story? Sure, she said. I said, you know I used to be an actor in Hollywood, right? Oh, that's right, she said. I'd forgotten that. You know, as an actor, I was making a living. I was in the business. I was a pretty small speck, but, you know, I was in the community. One night, my wife and I were given tickets to the opening night of a play at this big theater. Now, I had worked at this theater half a dozen times as an actor, so I was like family. And it was a critic's night, and they wanted to have a friendly house, so we got tickets. We're all part of this big crowd that's funneling into the theater, and suddenly behind us, coming through the crowd, comes Gordon. Now, Gordon was not only the head of this very theater. He had taken shows to Broadway. He had won Tony Awards. Gordon in Los Angeles was the anointed king of the theater world, and rightly so. So he's being ushered through the crowd, and people are saying hello, and people are giving him hugs, and all the while he's moving forward. You know, it's all very Hollywood celebrity arrival. My wife is standing right behind me, and she says, are you going to go say hello? Now, you have to understand, I knew Gordon. Gordon and I had worked together. He had cast me in a play that he had directed. You know, that was intimate work we did together. And I'd been in other shows there. He knew me. So my wife says to me, are you going to go say hello? And what I said back was, oh, he doesn't want to talk to me. That was my relationship to authority in those days. I made myself so small because authority scared the crap out of me. I, I think I've always remembered that night and those words because I never wanted to feel that small again. After a minute, she said, I'm thinking about my own relationship to authority. Oh, yeah, and how's it look, I asked. Not bad. I'm not great with doctors, to be honest with you. I don't advocate for myself very well, but in general, I think I'm pretty balanced when it comes to authority, especially now that I have more of it myself. <laughs> yeah, it's nice when that happens, isn't it? Yeah, she said. You know, at some point, you look around and you realize we're all just folks. Some folks are nice and some folks aren't. But no one has the secret crystal. It doesn't matter what their title is. We're all just doing our best and lucky if we wake up tomorrow morning. That is too true, Christine. What about you these days, she asked. Are you still fearful of authority? No, not much. It maybe flickers a little bit now and then, but no, it never gets too bright. What changed? I said, 
listening to people in authority for almost 30 years, that has completely demystified authority for me. Seeing how the sausage is made, she tossed in. Exactly. That and 20 years working with a really gifted therapist. She has helped me shed so many old reactions and beliefs. Christina and I decided we would offer Matthew coaching. He was eager to take it. During the coaching, Matthew and I talked about his relationship to authority. We worked on unmasking his stand-in and taming his wild child. But most of all, I challenged Matthew to just notice that the pattern existed. Learning to notice the pattern and then learning to name it were important steps on his journey to the look and sound of leadership. It's true, I hated feeling small. That hate and that shame motivated me to find a way out of my patterns. It was also a lesson. You know, the lesson was that growing up doesn't mean you stop your old patterns. The patterns might look different as a grown-up, but it's all still the same. And it's why I told Matthew's story the way I did. I wanted to start with this nice guy, this smart guy, who acts out sometimes. He was acting out his old patterns. When there's acting out in your workplace, it's usually old patterns that aren't working for someone. And, you know, sometimes that someone is you, right? If you want to look for a root cause, you might look towards the relationship to authority. Is the person fighting authority? That's the name of this episode, right? We all have weirdness when it comes to authority. I'll tell you just one story of many that I've experienced over my career. This happened fairly recently. I was coaching a very senior leader at a very big entertainment company that was owned by one of the mega studios, right? Can you hear how big this pyramid is? It is this weird cross-section between gigantic commerce and gigantic art. Like, think the size of, like, the Avenger movies, right? This is huge stuff. So Lincoln is this guy I'm coaching, and he's a pretty senior guy. And I love talking with him. He's smart and he's relaxed, except he's not relaxed when we talk about him presenting to the head of the studio. Lincoln gets visibly nervous. And it wasn't because the head of the studio was a difficult person, by the way, or that, you know, didn't like Lincoln or something. This was all inside Lincoln, like an allergy that would get activated. My point is, here's this guy with this office the size of your house, and he has weirdness about authority. We all do. So what are you going to do about yours, right? That's the question. Okay, I've got two big thoughts about that, which I will share right after I give gratitude This month, oh my goodness, in my life, I just had so much abundance and I was grateful every day. But when I think about the podcast, I am grateful for you. Those of you who subscribe to the HTML email version, thanks. It's great to be in touch with you that way. Those of you who are sending in questions for our next Ask the Coaches episode, thank you. Keep them coming. And those of you who post reviews in iTunes, uh, that is truly the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you so much this month to, in Canada, UZF123. Then here in the U.S., Assistisis, Indy Atlantic User, Sunil Ravi, Alibi KZ, Chase556, Deuce67834, and Katie Cott 17 Thank you all for your reviews. Thank you for what you tell me. Thank you for speaking to others. To all of you over the years, thanks for keeping us alive. So the question on the table was, what are you doing to develop your relationship with authority? Here's my wish for you. My wish is that you recognize it as a real thing. Pay attention to it. Give it space. Raise your awareness. And once all that's happened, so what do you do? Two ideas. Here's a quick hit. If you just want to get more immersed and familiar with these concepts, there are a lot of related tips. In the very last paragraph of the story about coaching Matthew, I mentioned too, maybe you heard it, I said that I worked with him on unmasking a stand-in and taming his wild child. Those are both title episodes that have addressed this issue from different angles. Unmasking a Stand-In, Taming Your Wild Child. Three other episodes you might listen to are Conquering Fear, Negative Self-Talk, Self-Limiting Beliefs. And because this is universal, 
There are whole categories in the archive that, where you can go in and you can sort just by those ideas. Two examples of ways to sort the archive are self-talk and personal growth and self-development. This episode is tagged in both those places and more. Those categories are there because you can't achieve the look and sound of leadership if you don't take care of this part of yourself. Here's another way to take care of this part of yourself. This is idea number two, and I'm going to call this study. The study of you. This is going to be a course that you enroll in and that you stay actively enrolled in. So how would you study? For example, you might complete an assessment and then really study the profile. Learn some of the words. Take those words with you during your day and measure yourself against them. Study yourself. Or you can study with a guide. Guides are great. You heard about one of mine, the therapist I've worked with for decades. My study with her completely changed my relationship to authority. Study. Make a commitment. Stick with it. Don't make it a New Year's diet that's gone in a month. Okay, that's it for me. Until next time, I'm Tom Henschel. Thanks so much for listening.